So the regulation of the insulin secretion by the glucose can be primarily divided into the chemical control, the hormonal and as well as the neural. The baseline insulin secretion is roughly around 1 unit per hour and 5 to 10 fold increase occurs following the ingestion of the food and the average amount secreted per day is roughly around 40 units. So the effect of the plasma glucose, the chemical uh, control is that the beta cells that ultimately cause the synthesis and the secretion of the hormone, they have the GLUT that they have glucose sensors that function through GLUT2 and glucokinase for the phosphorylation. Glucose is the principal regulator. There can be other regulators like the amino acids, fatty acids and ketone bodies that can also stimulate the beta cells. The response is biphasic in nature. So there is a rapid but short-lived increase in the secretion immediately postprandial and then there is a slowly developing prolonged secretion response that occurs for hours. So glucose enters the beta cells of the pancreas and then that causes the stimulation of the glycolysis. The glycolytic activity will cause the release of the ATP. Now this ATP which is produced, it, they, we have the ATP dependent potassium channels. So this ATP is going to cause the blockage of these ATP sensitive channels or potassium channels. So due to which there will be the depolarization occurring within the cells. There will be the movement of the calcium ions. The calcium influx will occur and all the vesicles that store the insulin, the insulin will be released from the beta cells of the pancreas in response to the increase in the glucose entry into the cells. Insulin potassium concentration. Insulin causes an increase in the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase enzyme. So when there is increase in the activity, what will happen? There will be increase in the movement of the potassium into the cells. So this intracellular potassium movement is very important in the management of the diabetes. In the case of the renal failure or in the case of the diabetes, if there is this excess of the insulin is, is given, uh, we find that uh, this hypokalemia might occur. Insulin and glucose are very effective in reducing the hyperkalemia in the renal failure. And hypokalemia occurs in diabetics when insulin infusion is given, especially in the larger doses than it is needed. So there will be this if uh, at the level of the hormones that we know there is insulin hormone, glucagon hormone and somatostatin which are being released within the pancreas. So there will be the delta cells uh, that release somatostatin. It will cause inhibition of the release of both glucagon and insulin and there will be the counter regulation by this insulin and the glucagon within themselves so that the fine orchestration is maintained of the release of glucagon and insulin this is how at the level of the hormone the uh, at the level of the pancreas we find that there is hormonal control of the glucose level so although there is growth hormone corticosteroids and thyroxine they will also cause the in they modify the insulin release and uh, but major action is going to be by these the interplay of these hormones Prostaglandin E inhibits the insulin release as well. So neural control. There is a rich autonomic nerve supply to the, uh, to the pancreas. So the alpha 2 will is more prominent than the beta 2. And the cholinergic or, uh, or acetylcholine or vagal mechanism, they will cause an increase in the insulin. So autonomic nerve supply will govern both the basal and as well as the stimulated secretion. And in the hypothalamus, the control is that the ventromedial stimulation will cause a decrease in the insulin secretion and the ventrolateral stimulation will cause an increase in the insulin secretion. Insulin excess is called as can be due to the insulinoma or uh, it is involved in insulin is also in excess can also occur in the diabetes man management. So inhibition of insulin secretion is complete at a plasma glucose level of 80 mg percent. That means when the plasma glucose level of 80 mg percent is achieved, after that the 
physiological mechanism function in such a manner that there is no more further requirement of the insulin to further reduce the blood glucose level. So manifestations of an increase in the insulin can be the direct effects of the hypoglycemia or the indirect effects on the nervous system. So when there is a diabetic patient and the, we gave the insulin and due to any reason inadvertent mistake occurs and the insulin goes more than what is needed by the body, the person is going to have the hypoglycemic features and they will be reflective of the nervous system stimulation. So the carbohydrate reserves in the neural tissue are very limited and they depend on the continuous blood supply. So when there is decrease in the uh, in the blood glucose level to less than 80 milligram percent, we start having the symptoms of hypoglycemia. They involve palpitation, sweating, nervousness due to the autonomic nervous system stimulation. And there can be another group of the symptoms which are the neuroglycopenic symptoms. And they are hunger, confusion, there is decrease in the cognitive abnormalities. And if it occurs and it is not controlled, it can even lead to the convulsions, coma and death. But when a person is chronically diabetic and he is taking his on insulin and the insulin is not properly managed, it can lead to the hypoglycemia unawareness. That means the person may directly slip into the severe form of the hypoglycemia even without having these neuroglycopenic symptoms and reduced autonomic nervous system stimulation. So that is why it is very important that the dose and the management of the diabetes is in particular so that the, it remains within the physiologic range. So now let's discuss about the counter-regulatory hormone glucagon briefly. It is secreted by alpha cells. It is synthesized as pro-glucagon and then thereafter converted into glucagon. It has a half-life of 5 to 10 minutes and it is degraded mainly in the liver. It has a molecular weight of 3488-85. So what are the major actions of glucagon? It, they, it performs all those actions which are counter-regulatory to that of insulin. That means it will enhance or increase the blood glucose level. It promotes glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, lipolysis and ketogenesis. It increases the ketone body formation by causing a decrease in the melonyl CoA levels in the liver and it also enhances the glucogenogenesis from the amino acids in the liver so that there is an increase in the blood glucose level. Importantly, glucagon does not cause glycogenolysis in the muscle. So what are the mechanism of action of the glucose output from the liver by the glucagon hormone? So the glucagon binds with its receptors that activates the phospholipase C and increase that leads to an increase in the entry of the cytoplasmic calcium. It activates and that causes this, uh, it also causes increase in the activity of the cyclic AMP. So that will cause increase in the activity of the protein kinase A enzyme and it also stimulates the phosphorylase enzyme due to which we find that buildup of the fructose 6-phosphate this is fructose 6-phosphate and uh, decreased metabolism leads to the increased glucose release. So ultimately what will happen? This process of glycolysis will be inhibited and we find that there will be enhanced activity of the phosphorylase that causes the degradation of the glycogen into the glucose 6-phosphate and by in the presence of glucose 6-phosphatase, more and more of the glucose will be released from the liver. So it increases the blood glucose level. It promotes the lipolysis. It increases the fatty acid oxidation that leads to ketogenesis. And it also has a calorigenic action. That means it will, by causing an increase in the metabolic activity, it increases the and also by increased heat generation is due to the deamination of the amino acids in the liver. It also stimulates the secretion of counter regulatory hormone insulin, growth hormone, somatostatin, and hepatic bile secretion. So, what is the regulation of glucagon secretion? So, whenever there is hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, there will be increase in the glucagon secretion. And there are other, there are many amino acids that will stimulate like the alanine and arginine. They will stimulate the glucagon secretion. And the gastrin and CCKPZ will also cause an increase in the glucagon secretion. On the other hand, when there is hyperglycemia, glucagon secretion will be inhibited. 
increase in the free fatty acids and ketone bodies or secretin and somatostatin they all will inhibit the glucagon secretion so now let's briefly discuss about a very important endocrine disorder that is uh, that is afflicting whole of the world and india is nowadays considered as the diabetes capital of the world itself that so in brief how what is the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus is called as the condition of starvation in the midst of the plenty that means we have sufficient amounts of the nutrients within the blood but the person or the patient is unable to utilize them for the metabolic activity and usually we consider it it is a disease of the carbohydrate metabolism that means the diabetes mellitus causes changes in the blood glucose but then the studies show that it is more a disease of the lipid rather than that of the carbohydrate metabolism the only the manifestation is that the blood glucose level remains very high in this condition so diabetes mellitus it occurs due to the impaired carbohydrate fat and protein metabolism due to the lack of the insulin secretion or decreased sensitivity of the tissues to the insulin or the combination of these two factors so it is characterized by the typical features of hyperglycemia that means the blood glucose level is high there will be the loss of the glucose through the urine that is glycosuria and weight loss in spite of polyphagia the weight loss will keep occurring although the person will be having higher amount of the appetite for the food it is so because there will be increase in the loss of the glucose and 1 gram of the glucose gives rise to roughly 4.5 kilo calories so there will be an increase in the loss of the glucose and increase in the loss of the of the glucose uh, of the energy also from the body it leads to hyperlipidemia negative nitrogen balance and it causes an increase in the ketone levels in some cases and what does it promote how does it cause the pathophysiology it does so by stimulating the non enzymatic glycosylation of the tissue proteins that occurs due to the persistent exposure of the body to the high glucose concentration and the accumulation of large quantities of sorbitol in the tissues so this and non enzymatic glycosylation is one of the major mechanisms through which pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus affects all the organs of the body when the blood glucose level is high or there is hyperglycemia in the body there is another fate of the glucose that leads to the pathophysiology so in an in the when the blood glucose level is high as it occurs in the diabetes mellitus and we know that the pentose phosphate pathway will keep producing excess amount of this nadph so this glucose will be acted upon by this aldose reductase enzyme especially in the insulin independent organs what do we find is that this aldose reductase will convert glucose to sorbitol and this sorbitol then further can be metabolized to produce fructose by the presence of sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme unfortunately all the cells have very large amount of aldose reductase but this sorbitol dehydrogenase is less expressed except in the seminal vesicles liver and in the ovary due to which in the insulin independent cells this sorbitol accumulation keeps occurring and this usually occurs in the renal tubular cells retina and in the schwann cells of the neurons it might occur in the placenta and in the rbcs as well so that will lead to increase this sorbitol will attract more of the water inside the cells and they will swell up and this leads to the microvascular complications which are one of the commonest complications occurring in the diabetes that means it will lead to nephropathy retinopathy neuropathy and it might also lead to the cataracts acceleration so this is the reasons that we want to control the level of the blood glucose within the normal limits coming to glycosylated hemoglobin hba1c levels normal life span of red blood cells is 120 days and hba1c levels are used to diagnose diabetes and to monitor the progress of the treatment or the management of the diabetes so hba1c level will depend on this it contains two components one is the hba hemoglobin type a and the level of the glucose 
and how much the glycosylation occurs non enzymatic glycosylation occurs due to the increased level of the glucose within the blood so what uh, in this the blood glucose levels are based on the glycated hemoglobin level how much we are how much the effect of the glucose is there on the on these hemoglobins hba1 so you hemoglobin type a is divided into hba1 a 1b and 1c and we usually measure the 1c level for the same so we know that uh, the glucose uh, will cause glycosylation of the rbcs and the life span of the rbcs is 120 days so if we can measure the hba1c level we can also measure the snapshot of what is the level of the generally the level of the glucose within the blood in past 120 days so the glucose non enzymatic glycosylation will give rise to the glycated hemoglobin and we will measure these levels see the glycated hemoglobin normal level is 4.5 to 5.6% in a pre diabetic condition when the blood glucose level is slightly more than normal it will be 5.7 to 6.4% and if a person has glycated hemoglobin level of more than 6.5% the person is declared as diabetic so the limitations of hba1c test are that uh, it may give rise to the decreased estimation if a person is having anemia or the liver failure and uh, for the management of the diabetes the adequate say that if the person can maintain between 6.5 to 7% it is considered as an adequate control 7 to 9% is inadequate control and more than 9% is considered as a poor indicator of the control of diabetes so they are fairly accurate levels their limitations falsely high levels are seen in the iron deficiency anemia and uh, it can also alter the it can give the altered report in the when we have increased levels of the uncommon forms of the hemoglobin and the blood loss or in the blood transfusion cases so diabetes mellitus fasting blood sugar test what is diabetes mellitus what are its levels so normally in a fasting state it is below 100 mg percent when the blood fasting levels are between 100 to 125 mg percent it is called as a pre diabetic condition and it is sometimes also called as the impaired fasting glucose when the fasting blood sugar level is more than 126 mg percent or higher it is called as the type 2 diabetes condition so how do we do that how do we measure these how uh, these levels we usually do the oral glucose tolerance test so in this test adults are given 75 grams of glucose in 300 ml of the water and we measure the levels after 2 hours so if the levels after the 2 hours are less than 140 mg percent the person is considered as normal if it is between 140 to 199 mg percent person is considered as a pre diabetes but if the post prandial after 2 hours we find that the levels are more than 200 mg percent or higher that indicates the type 2 diabetes mellitus so in diabetes mellitus we have the impaired carbohydrate fat and protein metabolism due to the lack of the insulin secretion or decreased sensitivity of tissues to the insulin or the combination of the both generally speaking we have two major types of the diabetes type 1 and type 2 type 1 diabetes is also called as the insulin dependent diabetes or the juvenile diabetes and the pathophysiology involves that there is decreased secretion of the insulin hormone by the pancreas and type 2 diabetes is called as the non insulin dependent diabetes or nidm and it does not majorly occur due to the decrease in the secretion but primarily the disorder or pathophysiology is that there is decrease in the sensitivity of the target tissues to the insulin that means there is resistance to the action of the insulin within the body so type 2 diabetes or non insulin dependent diabetes is also called as the adult onset diabetes because it usually occurs in the adult age and the abnormality can be in the glucose receptors of the beta cells and there can be the reduced sensitivity of the peripheral tissues to the action of the insulin due to the down regulation of the receptor 
There is another group of the disorders, maturity onset diabetes of young OD. It is a group of the monogenic subtypes of the diabetes characterized by the young onset that is in the patients who are usually less than 25 years of age. Presentation is that of the non-insulin dependent diabetes and there is beta cell dysfunction. There is genetic mutation, usually the autosomal dominant traits are there and the most common mutation occurs in the glucokinase, HNF1A, 4A and HNF1B. What are the primary symptoms of diabetes mellitus? Number one is hyperglycemia. That means there is increased blood glucose level and it primarily occurs due to the decrease of the entry of the glucose in the peripheral tissues and also due to the release of the glucose from the liver by the glycogenesis, glycogenolysis and due to this there is decreased utilization of the glucose within the cells and that leads to asthenia or the lack of energy. Polyuria, frequent and increased volume of the urine excretion occurs in the patients. There is increased glucose in the blood that exhibits the osmotic pressure leading to the movement of the fluids from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid and that promotes the intracellular dehydration. In the nephrons, now when the glucose absorption capacity is overwhelmed within the nephron, there will be the accumulation of the glucose within the tubular filtrate and that will cause that will also prevent the water reabsorption in the collecting ducts and uh, that ultimately leads to the osmotic diuresis polydipsia excessive intake of the fluids occurs because there is intracellular dehydration that stimulates the thirst center in the brain then there is polyphagia that means excessive food intake despite more blood glucose level it occurs so because the satiety center which is VMH, ventromedial hypothalamus, it is insulin sensitivity. Therefore, when there is diabetes mellitus and the glucose cannot enter the cell, the activity will be reduced. It keeps a tonic control over the feeding center. So the feeding center is present in the lateral hypothalamus. So when there is decrease in the activity of the satiety center due to the decreased entry of the glucose into this into the cells of satiety center there will be unchecked activity of the feeding center and this loss of the inhibition from the ventromedial hypothalamus will stimulate the lateral hypothalamus or the feeding center and the patient will have the tendency for excessive eating so decreased insulin is also uh, it is also accompanied with the increased glucagon and both of them are involved in the diabetes mellitus. So there is hyperglycemia and there is accumulation of the ketones leading to ketosis. This hyperglycemia leads to glycosuria that causes the osmotic diuresis and osmotic diuresis there is also the loss of various other cations like the sodium, potassium, calcium and loss of the intracellular potassium loss will lead to the hypotension, shock, tachycardia setting in and there is also this ketosis is usually accompanied with the acidosis that again promotes the water loss, dehydration that also causes the hyperosmolarity of the blood then the accumulation of the ketones will be occurring and this that is called as ketonuria because of all these factors there will be vomiting and there will there might be decreased glucose entry in the brain as well because of the ketosis and all other factors that are coming it also promotes the hyperventilation high acidosis and it also that will for, uh, further aggravate the water loss from the person and this hyperglycemia also contributes to the hyperosmolarity of the blood so all these factors along will cause the intracellular dehydration and that may promote the coma or the unconsciousness that occurs when the diabetes mellitus is uncontrolled when it is accompanied by the ketosis, acidosis, ketonuria and there is a very high level of the blood glucose within the body. Coming to the diabetes management, the first level of the treatment is by causing the patient to undergo the lifestyle modification. Patient is asked to go for the high fiber, high activity, mild to moderate level of the 
exercises and uh, to moderate the amount of the carbohydrate intake coming to medications insulin preparations are utilized for the management of the diabetes and they are given by the injected route there are various types of the insulin preparations like the rapidly acting that occur within 3 to 5 hours of then intermediate acting which work for nearly 20 to 25 hours we have short acting which uh, which mediate their action for 6 to 8 hours and then we have uh, long acting which work for nearly 24 to 36 hours then we also have the oral hypoglycemic agents one of the major groups is sulfonylureas which has the first generation and the second generation drugs then we have the biguanides and metformin is one of the commonest forms of the drugs that is given for the diabetes management then we have other groups like the maglitinide phenylalanine analogs we have thiazolidine diones alpha glucosidase inhibitors and every day we are having new other forms of the drugs which are coming into the market for the management of the diabetes so oral hypoglycemic agents in various combinations with or without insulin along with the dietary management and the lifestyle management are given for the management of the diabetes to summarize insulin is the chief anabolic hormone and glucagon is its chief counter regulatory hormone which are released by the endocrine pituitary insulin decreases the blood glucose level it promotes glycogenesis and inhibits glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis it promotes protein synthesis insulin promotes lipogenesis and it also mediates antilipolytic activity and decreased insulin level or sensitivity with increased glucagon level causes the diabetes mellitus signs and symptoms of diabetes mellitus include polyphagia polyuria and polydipsia thank you for attending to this lecture